He's Tom Berducci, MLB Network Insider, Sports Illustrated Senior Baseball Writer. Watch Tom on MLB Tonight and today, starting at 1 Eastern, part of MLB Network's 14 hours of live trade deadline coverage today. And his latest column was which teams are facing the most trade deadline pressure, starting with the Yankees. Yankees do anything today, Tom? I think they will. I'll be really surprised if we get to 4 o'clock, Dan, and they don't have an addition to this rotation. Now, I can't tell you who it is. I think my best guess would be Robbie Ray of Arizona. Uh, Certainly, they're going to talk to the Mets and have been about Wheeler and Syndergaard. But, you know, there's just too many, I think, continuing issues for that rotation. It's not like one or two guys just have a mini slump here. I think there's issues with that rotation, and they need a little more length, a little more reliability. So my guess is it'd be a bad day for the Yankees if they don't come out of this with a starting pitcher. All right, let me look at what the Mets did when they made the trade. They, you know, bring in a pitcher that most people thought was headed towards the Yankees. But I started to read some people I have great respect for. Bob Nightingale said it's a wonderful deal. You know, you can stockpile. You can trade Syndergaard. You can trade Wheeler. Like, you can you can do something. I just want to know what their game plan is. Because as a fan, that's all I want to know. What is our game plan? Because it feels like the Mets are sort of related to the New York Knicks. Not quite sure what their game plan is. So you being the all-knowing, all-telling, what are the Mets doing? Yeah, that's probably a good comp, actually, to the Knicks because the Mets don't want to admit that they need to retool, right? So they keep patching things. There's one reason why Brody Van Wagenen was hired. The Mets didn't want to hire a general manager who would give them a diagnosis of, hey, you're not good enough to be a postseason team. You need to start rebuilding now. They want to patch this thing together and start making runs and keep making runs at wild cards. That can get you in a lot of trouble. So they're continuing that M.O. Now, that being said, they did make a really good deal. I mean, when you see what the Indians got for Trevor Bauer, that deal looks even better for the Mets today than it did a couple of days ago because there's not a whole lot of difference between Stroman and Bauer. But I don't know what the Mets' next play is. I'm not sure that they do. But it's not going to be – if they trade Syndergaard or Wheeler, it's not going to be just – fortify the farm system i think they want major league ready players back whoever they trade yeah just trying to and and if they've cornered the market on pitching you know that's great if that's what their game plan is and and they're able to keep these guys and then they do something in the offseason like the reds getting bauer why did the reds go why did they get him and houston or some you know the yankees somebody else didn't get bauer for the stretch run well, first of all, with the Mets, stand, if they want to build on pitching, that's fine. But they put one of the worst defenses in baseball behind them. And with Stroman, <laughs> a sinker ball guy, that's what that's I mean true. about the plan, right? <laughs> it, that the plan is not a really good one. And as far as the Reds, kind of similar to the Mets in that they should be breaking this thing down. But their attendance, they've lost almost a million people in the wow. last three or four years. And baseball wow. in Cincinnati has really been struggling. That's why they took on a lot of one-year guys this year. And that's why... Now, Bauer is going to go in the rotation, not just for the next two months, but for next year. And actually, that's a great rotation when you think about Gray, Castillo, Bauer going into 2020. So that's another team that needs to make the team attractive. I think they did that, not necessarily better this year, but it was a more attractive team on the field. What about the Dodgers? Dodgers, to me, their big play here is trying to get Felipe Vasquez from the Pittsburgh Pirates. You know, the way that Kenley Jansen is throwing, I think they're concerned. The cutter velocity is down. He's throwing it less. He's very susceptible to home runs as he was last year. Uh, And in the perfect world, they want a lefty for that bullpen anyway. But especially a guy like Vasquez who could be kind of like co-insurance behind Jansen. Uh, The ticket on a guy like Vasquez is going to be huge. You know, the Pirates don't need to trade him. He's under control. Uh, it's going to take a really top-flight prospect. Think the Aroldis Chapman deal, right, with Glaber Torres going to the Yankees. That hasn't been the Dodgers' M.O. They've done a great job keeping the right young players, whether it was Jock Peterson or Cody Bellinger or some of the younger guys there. Um, but if they can't get Vasquez, I still think they're going to be in the market to try to find another left-handed pitcher. It might be Will Smith of the Giants. But they have to come out of this with another bullpen arm. He's Tom Berducci, MLB Network Insider, Sports Illustrated Senior Baseball Writer. I thought the Indians did pretty well last night uh, with, with their haul that they got. Uh, you know, and, and Puig, 
you know, I know we wanted to make him Bo Jackson. He's not going to be that, but you know, he's got respectable numbers and he's going to probably be a rental. What do you make of what the Indians did here? Yeah, I'm with you, Dan. They did great because listen, Bauer's a guy who's going to make 20 million in arbitration next year. He was not coming back to the Indians. So they were shopping him now or in the off season if they didn't like what they got now. And they liked what they got now. I mean, this is a team that was 10th in the league in run score. They definitely needed help offensively and especially on the corner outfields. And they just made the first trade in history where they got back two guys who hit 20 home runs. Two guys. It's hard enough to find one of those, and they got two of them in Fran Mil Reyes and Puig. So, yeah, you know, Puig is, to me, he's never been the kind of player who's as good as what the hype is. Yeah. But he's going to help the Indians. There's no doubt about that. All right, uh, last night with the bench-clearing brawl, what's the reputation that the Pirates have? <laughs> well, around baseball, they definitely throw more fastballs in than anybody else, right? So when you do that, you're going to hit a lot of people, and they do. So the reputation is that a lot of those hit-by-pitches are done on purpose. It, there's no question that's the way the teams look at the Pirates. Um, they don't try to back down from what they do. They want to push people off the plate. So, listen, when you play in your division teams 18, 19 times and it happens that much, and this is what happened with the Reds, you're going to have some hard feelings. You're going to have some issues that bubble up even before the game is played. And last night it just exploded. Yeah, but the Pirates are in last place. Is this strategy working? <laughs> yeah, you could argue that it's not for that reason. Um, but, yeah, they're – you know what's funny, Dan, is that most of baseball now has gone, I don't want to say away from fastballs, but fastball use has actually gone down a lot in the last four or five years because fastballs get hit. It's become more of a breaking ball game. And the Pirates are still operating, throwing two seamers in, right-handed pitchers, right-handed hitters. Um, so it's not a model that other teams are copying. And I think because now they do are one of the rare teams that throws a lot inside, it really stands out, and hitters aren't used to it. I also, you know, you look at this situation here. If if baseball wanted to get rid of this, you know, hockey is getting rid of fighting, whether they, you know, they announce it, they are. What what would you do if you're the commissioner and and I'm okay with you pitching inside? I I just don't like this. You showboated on a home run. I have to hit you, and then now you put the pressure on the other team's pitcher to hit another guy. And then when does it end? It just continues to go back and forth, but. Does the commissioner, how involved does he get in, into a situation like this? Yeah, a lot. Now, they're bound a lot by precedent, but I'm with you. First of all, I can't stand the whole macho business that because you did your job and you hit a home run off me, then I have to hit you the next time up or you, you stood at the plate and watched it a little too long. I can't stand that, and it's only a matter of time before someone really, really gets Man. hurt uh, on something stupid like that. I think what you're going to see here is a really harsh penalty on David Bell, the Reds manager. I mean, he was already thrown out of the game. So he comes out of the clubhouse to go on the field, and he makes a beeline for Clint Hurdle and actually made contact with him. When you're the manager, the Major League Baseball can hold you to a higher standard than the players, right? You're not protected by the union in terms of grievances. So you have a manager who's already been ejected, comes out of the clubhouse, onto the field, and actually adds to the fracas on the field, is not a peacemaker whatsoever at all. He's accelerating things. I'll tell you, the longest suspension I can think of for a manager for an on-field issue was Billy Martin got suspended once for a week for one of his many tirades against managers. It wouldn't shock me if David Bell gets at least a week of suspension. That's something I think Major League Baseball really wants to come down and say, we're holding you to a higher standard than the players. Well, didn't Pete Rose get like 20 games for bumping an ump? Yeah, I guess that was the Dave Pallone one. That yeah. was a bad one in Cincinnati. Yeah, yeah that, that might have been it. Uh, really hard physical contact, not just bumping an umpire, kind of pushing him and shoving him. But, again, in this case, he's already been thrown out of the game, and David Bell's already been thrown out of more games that, than any manager in Reds history over the course of a season. We still have two months left. <laughs> so he's a recidivist. They're going to throw the book at him. <laughs> uh, I'll leave you with this. Uh, you know, the Dodgers by far and away dominating, but – you know, we always look at some teams are built for the regular season. Some are built for the postseason. I like having Kershaw as my third starter in here. You've already talked about the bullpen. It feels like, you know, is this Groundhog Day again if, you know, when they get into the postseason? Are they better equipped this year than they were last year? 
I think they are better equipped. And to me, the difference is Ryu. Ryu and Bueller, but they had Bueller, and he pitched great last year in the postseason, but especially Ryu. You know, Rich Hill, we saw every time, right? He pitched five innings. As soon as the lineup went around the third time, he was out of the game. And the bullpen got a little bit taxed or overexposed in the postseason. I think this year, you're looking at length out of both Ryu and Bueller. And this kid, Julio Orias, now is, I think could be a difference maker out of the pen. Yeah, if I were to see the teams right now, there's no question in my mind the Dodgers would be number one. And I'm sure they think that way in their own mind, Dan. They haven't won it since 88, lost the last two, uh, losing the last game of the year by the same score in their home ballpark. I think anything short of a World Series championship is a disappointment for the Dodgers. And I, that may be an unfair bar to put on any team, but based on where how good they are in the last couple of years, in this case, I don't think it's unfair. Second best player in baseball is who? Uh, boy, that's a really good question. Um, you could go Francisco Lindor uh, because he plays such a premium position so well at shortstop, switch hitter, franchise type of player. It's a great question. Um, it just tells you how good Mike Trout is, right, that you started with number two. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but he's also, is it possible he's having one of his best seasons? Oh, I think he is because yeah. his plate discipline is better than ever. Uh, he may hit 50 home runs. You know, he may have a personal high in home runs. And his defense has been better, too. I mean, he's good defensively. Don't get me wrong. But it, the amazing thing about Mike Trout is he started as the best player in baseball probably seven, eight years ago. And he does get better every year. He's just I hope people understand, you know, we're looking at like a DiMaggio or a mantle of our generation. And I know the fact that he hasn't been in the postseason more than once and never won a game kind of dims that, that light. But uh, we're lucky to be watching this guy play in his prime. Would you put Yelich or Bellinger Ooh. in there? That's a great race uh, for MVP. Um I would right now lean a little bit more towards Yelich for MVP, but those guys have got to be in my top five. Again, I'm going to go more middle of the field than corner outfield guys. Talking about best players of the game, I always lean towards shortstop center field. But uh, you can't go wrong with those two guys. They've been so fun to watch all year. Tom, have fun today, and uh, we'll see you at 1 Eastern on MLB Network's 14 hours of trade deadline coverage today. Thank you, Tom. You got it, Dan. Thanks. Tom Berducci. The uh, MLB Network Insider, Sports Illustrated Senior Baseball Writer. For more Dan Patrick Show, tune in to Audience Channel 239 on DirecTV. Stream for free on BR Live or download the Dan Patrick Show app.